Jack of All Trails, and uh, today I'm going to tell you the story of Carabasa Gold, how it got here and where it goes from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the river. We're going to climb a mountain behind my, uh, my home where uh, I have spent a lot of time. We're going to go up one of my trails and we're going to go right to uh, one of the summits of the mountain where we can see very clearly um, what today is a dome was once the magma plug of a volcano. And we're going to observe a, uh, a vein of quartz as it goes down the mountain. Then we will go down to the river and uh, I'm going to take you to one of my claims and we're going to attempt to dig up some gold. So here we are at the top of the mountain and here we are at the beginning of the story. 550 million years ago, the rock that we are standing on was molten magma near the surface of the earth, uh, underneath the crust at the floor of what was then called the Iapetus Ocean, today in the place of the Atlantic Ocean. About 500 million years ago, the Iapetus chain moved very, very close to what is today the North American continental plate. This that we're standing on is the ancient core of a volcano. It is the magma plug. Very likely a main vent where the, where the, the, the magma went straight up out of the top of a volcano and spilled out as lava. I, I am surmising this from its dome shape. What's left behind of the hard rock as the glaciers came through left this shape uh, behind. Uh, suggesting that this was the top of the, vo of the volcanic core. This is where you'll find a lot of the activity at the very end of that, uh, of this particular mountain's volcanic stage and where the, uh, uh, the heavy elements were classifying themselves together uh, into, into seams and veins. They sink naturally, but through some fascinating processes of condensation, Gold can actually uh, latch itself onto lighter elements, rise to the surface. That's one of the ways it ends up sandwiched next to quartz. From here, we're going to move forward in time along the fascinating geological process along the slope of the mountain. And through time and space, we will follow gold along its journey. A couple hundred feet below the summit now, and around 440 million years ago, the Iapetus volcanic island chain has now been scraped off upon the shores of what will become North America. And inside this particular volcano, the elements are beginning to cool and are beginning to organize themselves. They're finding like elements and combining into compounds combining into large formations of like elements. Gold is finding gold, iron is finding iron. Uh, silica is finding like silica to become different compounds of quartz, uh, different uh, forms of, uh, of quartz. You see, this is mo uh, mostly composed of uh, uh, smoky quartz, but trapped in this quartz uh, is mica and pyrite and any number of other uh, uh, compounds and uh, crystal, uh, crystalline elements that form a great composite. And this large seam, you can see it goes from here where I found the crook in the rock, which is very likely the edge of the seam here, all the way over to this suture here. Parts of this seam exist far down on the middle slopes. And very likely it shoots straight through the mountain. This is a very large seam of quartz and it is very likely, almost definite, that somewhere within it, along its suture with the rock beside it, there are seams of gold. Here we are uh, down on the middle slopes of the mountain and what we have here is a formation called an alluvial fan and that is where water comes from the fall line and spreads out onto a shallow plane from a single point into a fan-like pattern. And when it does so, it slows down and it deposits its load. 
And right at the very top of it, we have this stack of large broken up pieces of quartz. Very likely come off the same wide vein that we observed above on the higher slope. These could be gold bearing float, or rather they could be shedding gold bearing float. Any one of these pieces could come off at any time during the freeze thaw cycle, or even just during the evening if the temperature dips a lot, or if a moose happens to come down this trail here and uh, knock into this little loose piece right there with his, uh, his hoof. Uh, and if there's a, a grain of gold underneath that, it's loose now. And the next time we have a significant rainstorm, it's gonna pick up that grain of gold along with a lot of this duff right here and this dirt underneath. It's gonna move it right down into the alluvial fan. fan. It's gonna deposit it in a placer somewhere down there. And then there will be another heavy rain that will excavate that placer, move it a little bit further down, and so on and so on, and that's how the gold moves on down the hill and into the river. So here we are down at the river, down at my uh, one of my claims on the Carabasset River. I'm going to tell the uh, last part of the story of Carabasset Gold, but by no means the last point of its journey, because the gold is always moving and will always be moving. Some of it uh, will stay a little bit though, right here in what's called a placer. So we're always going to be looking for gold on the inside curve of the river where the slowest water uh, uh, occurs. And I got to get down to the tightly packed rocks where, uh, the, uh, where the heavier sediments are going to lie. find myself a spot where the water's running but not too fast with a nice rock where I can sit down. You've heard me talk a little bit already about classification. What that really means is sorting materials out by what type they are. I do that with a combination of different techniques above and below the water. First thing to do is clean it. You can see it's very dirty. Gold is heavy. It's the heaviest thing in my pan right now. So I'm not too awful worried about it spilling over the sides. What I'm trying to do first is create a slurry. So I'm going to stick my fingers in there and really mix it up. Make sure I get right down to the bottom and liquefy the entire contents of my pan. Now I'm ready to start panning. And the idea is to always keep the bottom of the pan lower than the edge of the pan. That's where your gold is, right down here. At first, I take great big layers off. I'm not too concerned. As we go down, I'm gonna make my movements smaller and smaller. My first four or five dips here, you can see I've gotten about half the material out of the pan already. Now I'm gonna reclassify my pan. I'm just gonna make sure that all the heavy stuff is on the bottom, all the light stuff is on top, because I have been a little bit uh, uh, violent with it here, and things might have gotten mixed up. And I'm going to stop and do that several times over the course of each pan just to make sure that all my gold is sitting down in that little slice down the bottom. Right. You can see down here in the corners at the bottom, it's starting to, to show black. And that's because I'm getting down to what's called magnetite sand. And some of that is actually magnetic. If, if I were to have a magnet here, I could pick up that sand out of the bottom of my pan with it. I'm just using the riffles to pull out the last of the light sediments. I washed this bucket a couple of times, we're more likely to find gold at the bottom of it. We're close to the 
end of the story now, but it's not the end for the gold. Oh, I have a piece. Tiny, tiny piece. At least one. That is it. Tiny fleck of Kiribati gold. That's pretty much like most of the gold I find here. That's it right there. I'm Jack of all trails, and uh, I've really enjoyed the day today. I hope you have too. Uh, hearing the uh, the other side of the story about gold, how it comes down here to the river, because Kiribati Valley is a really uh, unique place, and it's a neat place to demonstrate that uh, that story. It, it unfolds right before you. Thanks for coming out today. <laughs>